welcome. I'm Dr. Friedman, and uh, I'm really excited to talk about a topic of mine that I believe is a deeper purpose of mine to share about. When I grew up, I had an intuitive feeling that there are two things that I'm here to help people with. One was to overcome anxiety, which has a lot to do with me having had a lot of anxiety in my life. And the other one is to help people to find peace. Hence my name, Friedemann, which means man of peace. I didn't choose that name. That were my parents who basically thought that this little boy needs to save our marriage since he's the second one and after the first one it didn't go so well. So let's make him the peacemaker. But I took that role and I embraced it and I do believe it's a part of my destiny. And, and what I want to talk to you about today is how to find peace with one of the greatest challenges that we are all facing. And that's the challenge of feeling powerless. Now, what do you and this fly have in common? You may think not much because you don't have these beautiful eyes and wings are also missing. But what we all have in common with this fly is that we are finding ourselves in similar situations just like this fly, when we are banging our heads against an obstacle that we think we can get through, just like the fly with a window. How many times have I tried to get a fly out of the house, trying to usher it to the open side of the window? No, it stays right there or it comes back and boom, another bang because it believes that somehow this translucent uh, material should open up magically and let it go into freedom. And we do often exactly the same way, trying to get out of a sense of stuckness or powerlessness with the same pattern over and over, not realizing that in the end, we only become more powerless. And so the topic of today's talk is the illusion of powerlessness, how to overcome subconscious survival patterns. And what I'm talking about today is based on my new book, The Empowerment Solution. Now, powerlessness is something I'm very familiar with. And funny enough, I felt probably the most powerless in my life when I was actually in a pretty powerful position. As a resident in cardiology, you could say, well, a doctor has a power over life and death. But I felt small. I felt overwhelmed. I felt not on purpose. I didn't enjoy that we were basically treating symptoms and barely having any times for the patients and ultimately just having to send them off with some treatment and some prescription only to know that in six months they're probably going to come back because we didn't really deal with the root cause of their strokes or their heart issues. And so at some point, anxiety and panic woke me up, made me realize that I'm in a powerless position because I'm stuck in a career that didn't really feel fulfilling and that drained me and in many ways also made me more callous because my sensitive side couldn't handle always seeing pain and suffering and being in that position of having to decide what's going to happen next. So I noticed something changed inside of me. And so a panic attack woke me up and said, is that really it? Do you want to stay in that job for another 25 years? And that basically was the beginning of everything. That's when my life changed and transformed. And this is one of the many reasons why I'm talking to you today. Now, do you feel also powerless? Do you have a sense that there is a powerless constantly present in your life? And if that is the case, I want to address four questions today in 
this talk. One is, why is powerlessness the new epidemic? What is the root cause of powerlessness? Why do we feel this way? Why is powerlessness an illusion? And how do we become more empowered? But let's go first to that sense of powerlessness. Maybe you feel like, nah, I cannot really relate to this. I never really feel powerless. But let's say you go through a regular day. You wake up in the morning and you get already kicked out of bed by alarm that is way too early telling you it's time to start the day. You have been in the middle of a beautiful dream and oh God, now I have to start another day, another mountain climb. You turn on the radio and right away you get bombarded with all this negativity and all the fear mongering about why the world's going to end anytime soon. Then you're sitting in traffic, nothing moves. And every day you feel what a waste of time, but you don't know what else to do. You get maybe mad at some other drivers that cut you off, but that doesn't make you feel really empowered. Even the line at the coffee stand seems to not move and the barista seems to be extra slow and maybe even ignore you a little bit, which doesn't feel good. At work, you get constantly reminded that there is a deadline to be reached, a report to write, a meeting to go to, and as always, you feel completely behind. Then your computer breaks down, you call technical support, and usually you don't get them. All you get is just this nice little please wait music that drives you absolutely nuts, and after 20 minutes, the call drops and you have to start the whole thing all over again. And your colleagues all seem to have such a good time. They seem to have it together. They seem to chat and progress and you always feel somehow left out and somehow left behind. Coming home, you get greeted by a stack of unpaid bills, a kitchen that looks in a total mess, a teenager who is really thrilled to see you. And you greet yourself because you also feel pretty powerless with yourself. Your weight seems to go the opposite direction than your bank account. You are annoyed with your emotions that seem to be more and more out of control, not really knowing what to do about them. Not to mention the big ticket items that are constantly on your mind. There are the pandemics that are looming over us. There is the threat on democracy. There are wars waging in the world. There's gun violence every day. There are climate changes. There are AIs now looming in the dark, trying to take over the world. There is Armageddon for sure happening in the near future. And on top of it, you have to go as every Sunday to your in-laws and eat all this meat, even though you want to stick to a vegetarian diet. Now, doesn't that sound pretty um, disempowering? But isn't it strange? Because the way you feel is actually how the majority of people are feeling. One of three Americans suffer from anxiety, depression, and low self-esteem, according to statistics. But 50% and more feel down and powerless since 2020, which certainly had to do with the pandemic. So why do we feel so powerless? Isn't it true that in the end, we are actually very powerful when you think about it? How much have we accomplished in the first two, three years of our life? I mean, getting out of the womb is already a pretty big adventure, but then learning how to turn yourself and start walking and standing, how to communicate, how to even feed yourself. All of those things are signs that we are very powerful. And there are signs also that deep inside of us, we're not giving up. When something doesn't work, we're not just saying, well, I guess I well, never really able to walk because it's already three times that I fell on my nose. That's that. 
No, we have an innate drive to simply keep on going, trying again, and ultimately succeeding. So when did that change? Now, I do believe that most people would agree that the sense of powerlessness has increased in the last 30 years. And I think there is good reasons for that. One of the reasons is that there is a much higher demand and expectation on us to lead busier lives, whether it's that we are, you know, asking for just a, a better lifestyle and feeling more compelled to have more and get different experiences, whether it's just that job security is lower and we have to fight for survival, whether it's that now both uh, partners are working and often the children are just an additional task. Whatever the reasons are, our life seems to be more and more busy. And as I often say, busyness seems to be like our default. And it also becomes a little bit our excuse because saying I'm busy basically, you know, makes you free to not have to engage in anything that you don't really want to engage in. It's almost like a, a justification for existence, but we are paying a price because no matter how busy we are, no matter how many to-do lists we are checking off, no matter how much we are trying to climb that mountain, for some reason, we are still feeling we are behind and that leads to stress. Another reason to feel more stressed than 30 years ago is a mental overload. The omnipresence of screens, as much positive they have maybe brought in the world, just like me talking to you. But there is also something that has been like an overload of our mental capacity. While computers have been dramatically evolving over the last 20 years, our brains just couldn't really keep up with that. So we are using our brains in ways that makes them overheat. You wouldn't abuse your car by driving it 20 hours on full speed. You wouldn't abuse even your body by being in the treadmill for 12 hours a day. But with our brains, we believe it should just be always aware, awake, and capable. And so we are creating a restlessness inside of us because our mind simply cannot sift through all this information it gets and easily gets overwhelmed and confused. On top of it comes also the lack of rest. We simply don't find enough sleep, enough downtime, enough time to let our minds simply relax and uh, expel and release all the stuff it doesn't really need to take care of. And in studies, they have shown that 40% of working Americans alone are not getting a long rest. And the effect immediately is that we once again feel a greater amount of stress. Although we are more connected than ever before, and we have more friends than ever before, we also feel more isolated. And this isolation is another factor why we do feel stress, because if we are isolated, if we are insecure to meet people in person, even making a phone call makes us feel uncomfortable. It's way more comfortable to send a text message and a few emojis than actually having a conversation where we are hearing each other. That form of isolation leads also to that belief that ultimately we are on our own. That's it. And that puts a lot of pressure on our mind and creates more stress and lends to a greater sense of powerlessness. And since we do feel that our mind is overloaded, life is busy, we feel alone, there is a greater amount of fear since there are these, you know, fear mongering messages that we are listening to and forced to uh, somehow absorb. We are much more prone to also look for answers, to look for something 
that saves us, that makes sense, that tells us the truth. And when our defenses are down and when we feel more powerless, we start distrusting, distrusting in institutions, distrusting in science, distrusting in anything that we used to hold on to and are more open for conspiracy theories that are basically throwing everything upside down, whether it's QAnon, whether it's lizard people, whether it's flat earth, there is a sense of we lack faith. So we are trying to look for something that helps us to make sense of the world that seems more and more chaotic and with less and less meaning. And all of this together is a scenario that makes us in the last 20, 30 years way more powerless and anxious than before. And there are probably other reasons that you can come up with, but when you think about it, you could say, wow, this makes sense that we are in some ways on a constant defense, self-defense mode. But the question is who does defend us? And this is where the subconscious mind comes in. Now, what is the root of this powerless? What is the role of the subconscious in this regard? Our mind is often seen as an iceberg. That's a very common analogy. The, the smaller part sticking out is the conscious mind, the, the deeper part, the subconscious mind. The role of the conscious mind is pretty straightforward. It's thoughts, logic, planning, and awareness. It's pretty much what we often identify ourselves with. We do see more that power comes from that rational part of the mind. And we kind of look at the subconscious more as this obscure thing that gives us nightmares, that uh, even though we want to lose weight, puts ice cream cones into our shopping cart. The subconscious is a uh, more like seen as an enemy that makes you do things that you don't want to than an ally. But the fact is, your life is probably to 70 to 80% run by the subconscious mind. And your conscious mind is just the illusion of control. Because let's face it, the subconscious does hold our beliefs and values. We don't really consciously choose our values, they're often imprinted and programmed inside of us early in our lives. Of course, eventually we can choose to change them, but most people do not do that. Most people are staying stuck in their old belief system. And I tell you in a moment why this can be challenging for us. The subconscious is also responsible for our emotions. If we, for example, Think about the times where we are waking up in the morning for no reason we feel anxious or for no reason we feel somehow insecure and nothing really has happened. And on top of it, this is the day where we should actually maybe, you know, be in our best because there is a meeting at work or you go on a date and, and you find yourself small and, and self-conscious. That doesn't make logical sense. But as you can see, the emotion simply overrides whatever you're consciously try to intend and holds your, holds your day hostage. The subconscious also holds memories. Think about the room you grew up in. Maybe what uh, the color your walls were or the smell of the kitchen when your mom baked cookies on Christmas. All those things come back to you when you think about them as if they have been stored somewhere in the basement. And as soon as you ask, hey, can I have access to this memory? It comes back. And that is another beautiful function of the subconscious mind. The subconscious does also most of our mind body connection. It's very simple because we cannot really consciously breathe. We cannot really consciously flex or stretch our muscles. We just can say, let's raise the arm. And then the subconscious does all the rest. It's the intercessor between our conscious mind and the physical body. 
and the conscious mind, uh, the subconscious also is in charge of anything that happens automatic, whether it's playing an instrument, brushing teeth, shaving, eating in front of the TV, you don't really have to have conscious control. The subconscious takes care of it. It drives you even to work when you are already sitting there in your office and somehow you don't create an accident. So the subconscious is really there for you. And it is also the part of you that really filters out most of the unnecessary information that may come at you. And it chooses what you are supposed to pay attention to and what not. Unfortunately, that can backfire, especially if you're dealing with beliefs that are not really serving you as much anymore, like a limiting belief, let's say, you know, how many of us actually have struggled with this belief to not be good enough and be afraid of failure. And then you do something and you have 10 people really patting your back and say, this was amazing. Wow, I'm so proud of you. And one person said, mm, I think you could have done this better that's the person we focus on that's what's important to us simply because the subconscious in that belief system of you're not good enough will only highlight that what is fitting into that belief system and all the rest gets discarded but there is a good reason for that and that reason is that the subconscious tries predominantly to protect us whenever we are somehow seen as small, powerless, and in danger, the subconscious comes in and says, I take over. I know what to do. And when we feel safe and at ease and we feel empowered, then the subconscious says, okay, I guess I don't have to protect you anymore. Let's go into finding more fulfillment, more joy, more pleasing, more a sense of making life purposeful. But most of us these days are more in the protection mode of the subconscious than in that having the subconscious as your inner ally that helps you to live with greater meaning and joy. And that is what we want to turn around. That is what this is all about, to get out of this powerlessness so that our subconscious no longer has to just focus on protection, but it can actually focus on helping us to create the best life that we are capable of. Now, where this starts is usually this protection mode of the subconscious early on in life. Now, here are two examples of two little boys. It's actually both me, one a little bit earlier than the other where I can remember viscerally how bad I felt. One was that I got thrown in water and I was really scared. And again, someone thought it was funny. And the other one was that my parents put a little flower crown on my head and thought I was so cute and I felt so ashamed and embarrassed. And of course, they had to take many pictures because it amused them. Now, in my mind, these are moments where I felt small and powerless. And we all have those moments. You know, we often think the subconscious only protects the ones that really got severely abused or went through deep trauma. But that's not the case. The subconscious protects us always, especially when we are small, consciously not very evolved, and seemingly dependent on others. And when these others, parents or other authority figures, are the ones that give us shelter and that uh, supposed to keep us safe and ideally give us a little bit of love, well, the subconscious says, okay, what can we do to pay for our keep? What can we do to get through this fairly unharmed? Now, then we get harmed like in these two examples, and then we do cry, and then we do feel pain. And the subconscious watches this, notices what has happened, and then starts to make sense out of it. And it says, okay, I can notice that certain things can happen to you. And in order for those things to not happen, we gonna make sure that there are some beliefs that warn you, that protect you, 
from that to occur again. So let's say, for example, you are, uh, you know, growing up already aware that your family can make fun of you, can embarrass you, can make you feel small and ashamed. And the subconscious has started to believe, okay, you cannot really trust your family, just stay a little bit away from them because you never really know when you come become the butt of the joke. So let's keep a distance. And as a child, you just did this by sitting in the corner, reading your book, trying not to get too much attention. And when there was, you know, this uh, party getting more and more jovial and laughing, you just leave the room so that you're not a target. As an adult, the belief that you cannot really feel safe around your family is still installed because the subconscious holds on to it. So then as an adult, you live on your own, you have your own adult life, but you get an invitation from your family to any kind of event. Immediately, your subconscious says, Ugh, remember that, how bad that felt and how you were really, you know, just made fun of and how you cried. And do you remember that the belief people like to make fun of you is actually your law of the universe in this situation? Well, there is shame, fear and embarrassment just by coming up in this or just by thinking about this memory. And then the subconscious says, once again, we just have to cancel. Remember, it was always safer to avoid the situation than to engage in it. Let's cancel it. Let's get back into the comfort zone and feel safe. Pretty ingenious, right? You, you think like, wow, the subconscious is really good. It keeps track. It makes sense of it. It sees already the writing on the wall. It creates certain defense patterns and then it gets us back into safety. It all works beautifully until it doesn't. And there is a reason why it doesn't. But before we go there, let's look at the different patterns the subconscious has installed in most of us. I would say actually all of us, and I can prove it to you in a moment. There are two major, I call it survival modes or survival patterns, because for a child where all this starts, it is really a matter of survival because you cannot really survive on your own. So the modes are the avoider mode, where you just get away from anything that is dangerous and that can appear somehow harmful, or the pleaser mode, where you go towards the ones that you feel like they need to love me, support me, I'm dependent on them, so let's make sure that I get some kind of an acceptance and approval. And in the avoider mode, there are three patterns that I have observed over and over again with my clients. There is a victim mode. And the victim mode is basically saying, well, there has been betrayal, hurt, harm in the past, and it's probably going to happen again. So I'm just going to keep everyone at arm's length. I'm going to remind myself constantly of what happened. I will not let go. And so this way, I'm going to avoid to once again get hurt. Then there is the invisibility mode. That is the mode where you make yourself very small and your life very predictable, where you don't want to get any negative attention, where usually you dress yourself in inobtrusive colors, you never really uh, get into a conflict, and certainly you don't really have a big social life. This is very often one of the earliest survival patterns, especially in times when we are so small that we don't really have seemingly other options than hiding. Now, another pattern is the procrastinator pattern. I think a lot of people struggle with procrastination in their adulthood, of course, as well. The procrastinator pattern is basically the pattern that says anything that feels uncomfortable or can lead to failure gets pushed to sight. I don't want to deal with this right now. It's a pattern that also looks more for instant gratification than for long term success. My wife always calls this pattern doing the right things for the wrong reasons, which in my case was often when I had to write or study 
cleaning the refrigerator or vacuum the house because you get something done, you feel productive, but you don't really engage in what feels uncomfortable or what feels maybe overwhelming. And the subconscious gives you the satisfaction to still feel good about yourself and to have avoided any kind of thought about what you really should focus on. Then there are the pleasing patterns. The pleasing pattern, number one, is the chameleon pattern. And that's uh, the person that doesn't really know themselves, but is always looking for cues outside how to be, how to think, and what to really want in order to get some kind of a appreciation or some kind of an approval. And this is not only a pattern that you can see in in social interactions, actually a lot of people that are hooked on social media and looking for the cues on, well, what's in, how do I suppose to look, what do I suppose to wear, what do I suppose to buy? That is a part of the chameleon pattern because it's not really an expression of your authentic truth. It's more like dictated from the outside in order to somehow fit in. And then there is the helper pattern. The helper pattern is something that I'm certainly very familiar with as the peacemaker of the family. It is where you are helping others, getting out of your way, taking care of them, and always doing more than you actually should and maybe even can do, because it's very important for you that other people are happy or that they have what you, what you think they need or want from you. It's not being nice, the, the pleaser pattern. Some people misunderstand the pleaser pattern as something as, well, if you are, you know, let's say you don't want to really go to a, a party, but uh, you know this is the birthday of your best friend, and so you just say, hey, I'm going to go anyhow because I want to make this person not feel, uh, you know, I don't know, forgotten. And then, you know, the critics of the pleaser say, well, this is a typical pleaser pattern, but it's not unless you want a pat on the back or a thank you or you're so amazing in return. What makes the pleasing patterns, the pleasing modes, really survival modes is that we are not doing this, what we are doing, whether it's the being the chameleon or being the helper, just because we are good people. But it's actually that we want a sense of security, a sense of being valued, a sense of belonging in return. And we feel terrible if we don't get that. And then the last pleasing pattern is a lover pattern. And that is a pattern of those that really look for a person to make them feel complete, to make them feel whole. These are the people that don't really have other interests. They don't really engage so much in their work or in any other aspects of life. They don't really have hobbies. They only want love. Love is the reason to be. But it is not necessarily a healthy kind of love. It is often a dependent kind of love that also very often ends up in heartache. But because they do come from places in their early years where they didn't feel that they were lovable. They didn't feel that they were important or that they were cared for. It's often in situations where parents divorced or where someone died, that there is this void that needs to be filled by someone else. Maybe you think like these survival patterns have nothing to do with you. Maybe they seem too extreme and you think, well, you know, I'm in a happy relationship. I'm living in the present moment. I'm an overachiever. And I certainly am a social person who has a big range of friends. What are you talking about? Well, what I'm talking about is that you also have subconscious survival patterns. And I'm going to show to you what they can be. So these are more of the covert patterns. Now, Anything that makes you feel powerless gets you into the victim pattern, whether it's the IRS, whether it's the traffic, whether it's the fact that maybe others have gotten a promotion at work and you didn't, 
whether it's your child that once again just uh, doesn't seem to communicate any other than slamming doors and grunting all of those things can make you feel powerless and make you feel like the victim of the circumstances so here's your victim pattern then there is the invisibility pattern people often think invisibility means like to be a little mouse a little wallflower that really has you know no uh, obvious appearance or appeal but the interesting thing is that the people that are hiding themselves the most are the people that want to appear a certain way to the world. These are often people that are appearing strong, in control, and, uh, and uh, yeah, untouchable. But what's really deep inside, no one can see. And when you're really honest to yourself, are you showing vulnerability to other people? Are you talking about your fears? Are you open about pain or sadness? And maybe you're not. Maybe you're even hiding yourself from the closest people because in your mind, they will not accept those invisible aspects of yourself. And that makes you once again feel powerless. And then there is a procrastination pattern. You know, I'm, you may be the busiest person in the world and a great go getter. But in the end, are you really not also procrastinating about, let's say, self-care? Or what about a hobby? Or what about having more friends, taking care of your closest relationships, your, your partners, your children? How about all these aspects of your life that are in the shadow of that one thing that you identify yourself with, which can be your career. That is a form of procrastination. And that is where the blind spots in your life may be. Pleasing is the same issue. There is a chameleon. So you may say, no, I have strong opinions. And I'm certainly someone who doesn't really have this issue of blending in. But then you may compare yourself then you may be someone who always looks at the neighbor, that car, wow, I should have that too. Or this person on social media goes to this island, well, I should go there too. And you don't even ask yourself whether you want it. You just let yourself be convinced that that is desirable because there are a lot of likes on Instagram and you should also have at least as many. And so you become not your true self, but more a chameleon self that is trying to adjust to other people's ideas or expectations. The helper pattern is easy because I think a lot of people that don't feel like they have the helper problem are still lacking boundaries. And this may be at work. This may be with your parents, with your family. You may feel like that, no, no, I'm taking good care of myself and I'm really my own person, but somehow you still feel when they need money from you or when they want you to come to a, you know, to some kind of a gathering or when your boss asks you to uh, hurry up or stay longer over the weekend because it's crunch time, you just say yes and you don't say no. And that is, again, wanting something in return in order to somehow feel safe or somehow feel uh, accepted and wanted. And the lover pattern is an interesting one because you may really be in a happy, healthy relationship or maybe you do feel like, I don't really want love in my life, but ask yourself or tell yourself for a moment, I love myself. Just repeat after me, I love myself. And just notice what happens inside of you. Because self-love is a very important key to empowerment. And most people are lacking self-love. When they say out loud, I love myself, it makes them cringe. It makes them feel uncomfortable. It makes them feel like, mm, I don't know, I feels cheesy. Now, the Germans are the worst because they are not used to say, I love myself. Love is really reserved only for a few, maybe the mom and the romantic partner, but nobody else. So that's really tough for them. But 
again, self-love is, I think, one of the pillars of a fulfilling and happy life, and we just overlook it over and over again. So maybe you're now more curious to see how you can overcome those survival patterns, because living in them is certainly fraught with a lot of problems. When we are looking at the subconscious as an inner protector, as the, let's say, overzealous nanny that just makes sure that we are okay, the subconscious has one big problem. The problem is that it is pretty much continuously doing the same thing over and over again until finally it is told to do something different. It is like, sorry, it is like it is in a, in a owner's manual of the past stuck. And unless we are rewriting this owner's manual, we will go through the same patterns just as we did when we were young. And one example for, or several examples. So let's say you have the pattern of invisibility and you feel at work absolutely in your power. You have your nice costume on and you are in the lead, but then you go out, social setting, you don't know anyone. And all of a sudden you shrink and you find yourself in the corner, zipping on your drink and, and just hoping that no one's gonna talk to you because you feel small, just like you did in high school when there were the dances and no one really cared about you. Or let's say you feel like that, uh, you know, you always had a trouble with getting approval or love from one of your parents. And as soon as you are at home and there's just the slightest criticism, immediately there is this feeling of, oh my God, what do I need to do to make up for them, for making them see that I'm a good person, that they can be proud of me. Whenever we feel that something inside of us shrinks, whenever we feel like there is a, a drain of our power and our adult self combined with some heart racing, anxiety, insecurity, you know that you're going into the subconscious survival pattern. It is really interesting how we can switch from something that may have made complete sense we are in control to feeling completely small and out of control simply because the subconscious got triggered. And that brings me back to this little scheme here where you can see, again, when triggers happen, the memory comes back from the past way back. The beliefs get reactivated. I'm not good enough. I'm not safe. I'm not lovable. I have to please others in order to be accepted, to get some approval back. The feeling of anxiety, the feeling of insecurity, the pattern kicks in, invisibility, or in general, a pleasing pattern. And then you think you feel safe. But do you really feel safe? Because what really happens is that you give your power away. And what I mean with giving your power away is that you, even though you are an adult, you don't believe that you are the source of safety and value. You look on the outside. You look either to avoid others, to somehow feel safe, to avoid discomfort or potential failure, to not get in trouble or you look for others to give you a sense of worthiness, a sense of belonging, fitting in, acceptance, love, and you completely forget that ultimately everything is inside of you. You need to know as an adult that you are the source of safety, belonging, and self-worth. And those patterns prevent you from even tapping into it because we are relying on this old owner's manual. For the subconscious, we are still the little helpless children that need to be protected. We give our power away, as I just described, by avoiding or pleasing. And we don't really spend time with ourselves. We don't ask what we want, who we are, what's really important to us. 
because it's all about just being safe. When we are in survival pattern mode, it's all about how can we make it through another day and who we are or what's our truth or purpose are just not really important considerations. And when we don't really know who we are and what we want, we ultimately disconnect from ourselves. And that is really, and that may be something that uh, I will talk another time about, but this is really, for me, the reason why we are also dealing with an anxiety pandemic. It is the disconnection from ourselves. It is the sense of not being at home with ourselves. It's this feeling of either having to constantly defend ourselves or constantly fend to somehow fit in. And as soon as we are by ourselves, we are feeling empty. We are feeling uncomfortable. Who is a stranger in my body? And we want to distract ourselves. We want to get away from ourselves. And that constant cycle of either latching on to someone, hiding from someone, and then also feeling somehow, yeah, very much uncomfortable, not at ease with who we are, is creating a lot of anxiety. And this anxiety may come from a deeper place, a deeper place that says, you know what? You're anxious because you're about six feet outside of yourself. You're not really within yourself. You're not really living your truth, which was exactly what happened to me when I had these panic attacks. The panic attacks in my residency didn't tell me, oh, you may fail, you may not measure up, you may not really make your parents proud. The panic attacks told me, you're not really living what you're supposed to live. You're not really who you're supposed to be. Often, this form of anxiety is misunderstood, but I think it can be a very helpful and healthy catalyst. So how do we get out of this powerlessness? The powerlessness from giving power away, the powerlessness of feeling disconnected from ourselves, from not even knowing who we are. What can we do? Why is powerlessness an illusion? So let's look at this. So you stop trying because the past repeats itself. Is that a fact or is it actually just the illusion? Because you could also say, well, maybe you only think the past repeats itself because you are repeating the same responses. You are repeating the same patterns to whatever triggers come from the past. Are you really held hostage by the past or have you just not learned yet and grown from the past? You keep your life small and yourself unnoticeable. Is that really because you are just in danger constantly, like a little bug in, in uh, danger to get squashed by someone who steps on you? Or have you simply not yet seen your own strengths, your own gifts, your own values? Is the reason why you feel you need to be unnoticeable that you haven't really noticed yourself yet? You're overwhelmed by unfinished tasks. Is it really that the tasks overwhelm you? Or is it your mindset that says that these tasks and whatever consequences they may entail are bigger than yourself? Is it your idea of perfectionism, that it's either all and all perfect or nothing that hasn't been replaced by it's about progress and not perfectionism? Is it simply a matter of looking at these tasks and subdividing them rather than seeing them as a big Mount Everest that needs to be climbed in flip flops? Same thing with you can't make decisions without others' input. Well, why is that? Is it really that others are smarter than you or that they know better than you? Or is it simply that you haven't spent enough time with yourself to make up your own mind? You never want to disappoint others. Do you know how often you hurt yourself by having no boundaries, by not taking care of yourself? Do you know that in the end, the only person that you're going to live with until the very last breath is you. 
So there is a reason for you to actually have a good, nourishing and supportive relationship and you deserve it, but you haven't yet given yourself permission to do that. You always look for love, but you only get rejection. Is that really a reason to be powerless? Or is there something inside of you that says that whatever void you have, whatever wound your heart is carrying, it cannot be anybody else's responsibility to heal that. It is yours because no one can give you that, what you're looking for, that makes you feel whole because you left your childhood feeling broken. The point is that we have options and that powerlessness is an illusion because we always can choose how to respond to whatever trigger we get. We can choose to either go into these old survival patterns or we can choose new ways to perceiving ourselves and new ways to respond and and be more empowered in situations that in the past made us feel scared, small and powerless. And for this, there are certain keys that I want to introduce to you in a moment. How do we become more empowered? That's a big question. Meet Mary. Now, Mary is the one in the background. I kind of, uh, you know, uh, changed her face or blended it out because I didn't necessarily want her to feel uncomfortable about sharing it, but I have permission to share her story. Now, she used this character out of an animated movie as the one that she really wanted to aspire to. And I forgot her name. I think it's Miranda or Miranda. It's uh, from that movie Brave. Mary is a person who grew up with a lot of hardship. She grew up with a father who was loving and adoring and a mother who was absolutely domineering, but also mean and, and abusive. But at least she had her father until she didn't have him anymore because he died when she was 14 years old, all of a sudden, heart attack. So she was left alone with her mother and her mother, she as the only child, basically never wanted to talk about the father and put all her attention on how she could control Mary. Mary became her servant. Mary was commandeered around. Mary was always told that she is not good enough and only if she does X, Y, and Z, she will be kept and not sent away and she will get a little bit of approval. Mary was forced to eat the terrible food that the mother was putting on her plate way too much and without any flavor until the last little bite, which every time makes her almost want to throw up. But if she wouldn't, the mother would physically abuse her, yell at her, send her to a room. So the consequences were too dire. So she rather pushed it all inside. This could have easily broken Mary's spirit. But for some reason, she managed to get away when she was about 20 and moved to the opposite side of the country. And she started her own life. She still felt obliged to regularly visit the mom and call her. And every time she felt just once again squashed and diminished. But she felt as long as I give her what she wants, as long as I'm her little pleaser and helper, I am OK. She married. She even started her own company. Everything seemed to come together when she was in her 50s and she was so happy. And still, the mother was a looming threat in her life. But she felt she had it in control. But deep, deep in the back of her mind, there was a little voice that always said, the shoe gonna drop, something bad gonna happen. You don't deserve to have all these wonderful things in your life. And so, Mary was not surprised when she became ill and she had a very weird illness, an autoimmune disease, which is called Crest. And that autoimmune disease made it harder and harder for her to swallow food. Her whole swallowing tube, her esophagus, became rigid and wasn't able to transport the food down into the stomach. 
And so at some point she could only eat soups and smoothies and it became worse and worse because the esophagus became also constricted and didn't really let food pass down. And after a few years like that, the doctors told her, sorry, Mary, I don't think that you can eat food in the future. I think you have to think about giving you a tube, a feeding tube that you just have to get your nutrition from. That absolutely scared Mary. And she was 100% sure that this is not what she's going to do. And from being very docile and, and uh, accommodating, there was an inner rebel showing up that said, forget about it. She canceled all her doctor appointments. She said, I'm going to find a solution. This is not how I want to live. And she looked and eventually she started working with me because she believed that if this is an autoimmune disease, that means I have created this disease. I can also uncreate it. There must be something I can do. There must be some root cause for that disease. I'm attacking myself. Why do I do that? What Mary found through our work together is that she was in that conflict with herself, a part of her, the, the pleasing pattern really wanted to continue to make sure that mom is okay. And another part of her said, no, I don't want this anymore. I don't want to be the one who is swallowing all this anger, swallowing all this food of being mistreated any longer. It's better for me to wither away and to die than to continue to live at the mercy of somebody else. I have enough. That was her inner conflict. She clearly felt it from her subconscious mind. And so as we went through her patterns and as we are, were resolving her traumas and all this emotional baggage and she unlocked with her keys more and more of her of her power she also realized that she could actually have clear not only boundaries in saying no to her mom but emotional boundaries towards her mom where she could make herself more important than whatever her mom wanted or however her mom was doing and so she kept her distance. She spoke up. I cannot visit you. I cannot talk to you. I need to heal myself. And she committed. She committed to self-care. She committed to developing self-love. She looked for that safety within. And she did these beautiful uh, uh, drawings and illustrations to always get more and more inspired, to tap more and more into these dormant strength that she knew she had, but she didn't really own. She didn't really identify herself with. And especially her subconscious had seen her so long as a helpless child, as a mercy of her mother, that emerging as the adult took some time. But after six months, she noticed that she can actually start eating more solid food again. Mashed potatoes and salmon was the first thing, and, and it got better and better from then on. And the last time I talked to her, this was eight years after we worked together, she still eats normal food, normal portions. She does sometimes have to go to stretch her esophagus because it has some scar tissue. But overall, she has healed herself. And she has stayed in this empowered place that she ultimately never believed was hers to be. If Mary can do it, you can do it too. And the keys Mary were using are those six keys to empowerment that I just want to briefly share with you. The keys are self-responsibility, which basically means that Rather than being the victim of the past or other people or the circumstances we were in, we have to think about how is everything that happens to us a learning opportunity? How are we teachers and students for each other? And sometimes the people that treat us the worst are actually the best teachers. How can we grow from what happened to us? And, 
and see that we are not defined by that, but we are defined by what we are doing now from that point on. That is taking responsibility for your life and for yourself. Self-compassion, rather than feeling like whatever you as a child has experienced is still the truth, and rather than condemning yourself to either being invisible or being angry at yourself that you're still feeling so small and insecure and anxious, have compassion with yourself. Try to connect to this little inner self who never felt that the world was a place that they belonged to, a place that felt welcoming and safe, and commit to be the source of love and compassion for that part of you. Try to also be more reliant when it comes to procrastination. The worst thing about procrastination is not that we don't get the things done, that the IRS doesn't get the money in time or the tax declarations. The worst thing is that we are lying to ourselves, that we are saying we're going to do it tomorrow or maybe next time or when we feel better or when the sun and the moon align and we don't do it anyhow. This lying to ourself is undermining our belief and our trust in ourselves. Just like if someone else would lie to you after the third or fourth time, and you would just not want to be with this person anymore. I would say, no, sorry, you are a liar. Well, we lie constantly to ourselves when we procrastinate. So learning to trust ourselves through relying on our word and knowing what we say is the truth. That is absolutely a key that is unlocking something that brings you closer into this feeling of I am safe. I am safe with myself. Self-reflection. It's all about asking the right questions. Who am I? What are my gifts? What am I really here for? Trying to not be an autopilot or having, you know, someone else uh, take the remote control and steer you around like a little mouse on wheels, be the person who knows who you are and what is right for you and learn to trust that. That can only happen through self-reflection. Self-commitment is being committed to your time and your energy and to whatever you give out needs to be in balance to whatever you bring back to yourself. Don't make other people take care of you, hoping that if you take 10 times more care of them, they're going to give you a little bit of breadcrumb back. No, take also that commitment to yourself that you will be the one who has not only clear boundaries, but also a plan how to nourish and recharge yourself. And then, of course, there is self-love, a big key, learning how to love ourselves is not really that complicated. Because if we are believing in the imperfect love, meaning we don't have to be the prince or princess to love ourselves, we can simply learn to be more unconditional and appreciate already what we have. But treat ourselves as if we would be the beloved. When you think about how Maybe it has been easy for you to love others, to care for them, to make sure that they're okay, to surprise them, to uh, indulge them something. All of those things can be really ways for you to learn to love yourself more because you treat yourself as someone who deserves to be loved. Those keys all together that are described in the book can really bring you to a place where you rewrite your owner's manual, where you are constantly in the role of your adult. You're not getting lost by external distractions or triggers. You're calmly centered in yourself and you know how to respond. Those keys are not difficult to use, but you want to engage your subconscious with it. These are not intellectual processes. These are not decisions only that you want to make. You want to use subconscious language to make those keys your own and introduce them to your subconscious. And the way the subconscious works 
is, or the way the subconscious communicates is through images, through feelings, through sensations, through simply having uh, some uh, self-talk that comes from the heart and not just from the head. There are ways for us to reach a subconscious that are not complicated, but they need to be consistent. And, and again, this goes beyond uh, the, this uh, possibility of this talk today. But if you're interested more, read the book. There are all these processes in the book described that can help you to utilize and claim those keys to unlock your potential. I want to just briefly touch on self-reflection. There is this beautiful quote that says, we are slowed down sound and light, a wave bundle of frequency tuned into the cosmos. We are souls dressed up in sacred biochemical garments. Our bodies are the instruments through which our souls play their music. Basically, what that means is that we are so much more than our physical form. We are so much more than the roles we identify ourselves with. We are so much more than our thoughts and our emotions. If we want to find ourselves as the source of worthiness and safety, we need to spend time reflecting on that, what I call the essence of our being. There is, there is the source inside of us that we may not be able to describe in words, but we can certainly feel it. And we feel it when we are looking at things that make us true to ourselves, act us in, a, in an authentic, truthful way. Exercise to get there is, for example, thinking about the accomplishments that you had in your life. Write down simply 10 accomplishments. Don't be so overly critical with yourself. Well, I didn't really win the Nobel Prize. I haven't been president, so I don't know that I really had an accomplishment. Make it simple. Anything that you had as a goal and you reached it is an accomplishment. Obstacles you overcame. Write down 10 obstacles you overcame. This can be even moving out of the house, going to college, having you know, your first breakup things that were a little difficult, they were challenging, where you were asked to deal with something that wasn't comfortable, and 10 ways you have been growing in the past, where you really feel like I used to be this person, you know, maybe I was a single bachelor, and now I'm a mother or father, and you really see the growth that comes from that, and with that, write down examples of growth. You're not defined by either of those things. You're not defined by your accomplishments or by these obstacles or growth. They're all fleeting. They're nice, but they're fleeting. What defines you is how you got there. What defines you is what the inner strength, the inner resources that are innate to you allowed you to accomplish, allowed you to persevere, allowed you to evolve. This can be you have enormous ability to, to be creative, or maybe you have an imagination that always allows you to look beyond the walls that appear on your journey. Or maybe you're just a very compassionate person, you have a lot of ambition, you, you're someone who likes to uh, contribute to others. There are about 50 different strengths that you can look up and choose from. You don't have to necessarily use only a subset of four or five for everything you write down. Ideally, you want to find more. But once you find those strengths and gifts that made your life, that shaped your life so far, where it's not about just survival, but where you actually felt you came from your strength, then you can, almost like you could imagine the rays of light, just trace back those rays to the source within you. And what I would like you just to do is a very brief little exercise with me. So I would like you just to 
close your eyes for a moment and connect to your essence. Close your eyes and think about a moment where you felt truly connected to someone through empathy or compassion. Think about when your heart really felt overflowing with warmth. It may be for a child, it may be for a beloved, it may be for an animal. It may have felt like this when you looked at a beautiful landscape and you felt so much love for that creation. And I would like you just to feel where this energy that you have been sharing in that moment, where that energy comes from. Imagine inside of you a light. And imagine inside of you that light that has always been there. Like a candle that always has been burning in your heart. And maybe over time, the candle holder, that glass that was holding it, got some smudge on it, got some dust and dirt on it, and so you couldn't really see the light as clearly. But now that you're spending some time reflecting on it, and maybe now that you can feel again this pure energy of love, compassion, empathy, warmth, that comes from that core essence of yours, maybe you can see and feel this light a little bit stronger. And just stay in the presence. It is like an inner source of gravity, your inner goodness. Stay in this presence for a moment. And simply repeat in your mind, I am enough. I am enough. I am enough. And breathe into this energy, into this light. And start having a connection. At first, it may feel more artificial. Maybe you even have to force yourself to imagine something like this. But eventually, you will feel almost like an automatic draw to that light. You may feel that something pulls you in. And you will be able to start to relate to your essence and see that it is a spring, a well of wisdom, of powerful energy, of answers, of guidance, of reassurance and safety, and certainly a place where you can feel at home where you know you belong to. And then you can take a deep breath in. Exhale. And just open your eyes again. The empowered self is possible for all of us. Einstein said that we are using only about 10% of our potential. And I do believe that those 90% that are dormant are in a majority hidden in our subconscious mind. And in order to tap into that potential, we need to update the owner's manual of the subconscious so that it is appropriate for our adult self. 
that it no longer leads us into self-defense, but into self-fulfillment, from surviving to thriving. I believe our subconscious is our greatest ally, but we have to learn to consciously collaborate with it. In the end, for most of us, we can survive. For most of us, it's not a question of living or dying. It's a question of staying comfortable. And I believe being comfortable is largely overrated because when we are more afraid of getting judged, of getting rejected, or failing, we are missing out on venturing out of this comfort zone and living with greater joy and purpose. We are keeping our lives smaller because we are too afraid of what is beyond it. And when you ask, like, a wonderful book was asking older people what is really their biggest advice to the ones that are 60, 70 years younger on what not to do. Their advice was not like, okay, make sure that you are avoiding this or that you are just keeping the head down and surviving. Their advice was to not buy into the fear or not buy into the discomfort because the greatest pain they had experienced in their lives was the regret of not having dared to live bigger lives and to make their lives expansive way beyond their imaginations. Because the empowered self is really accepting our authentic truth and power within, and approaching life with a sense of responsibility, self-reliance, and a deep desire to grow and evolve. And you know that you are the empowered self when you do feel, no matter what the circumstances, safe and welcome at home with yourself. And you don't only do this for yourself. We don't become the empowered selves because it's all about the one man show of joy and fulfillment. We become the empowered selves because then we are able to give and make that contribution that we are here to make. Our world needs us. And only if we are our truest self can we connect to others embrace and appreciate others as such and work together to make this planet sustained and heal it make this world a place where all of us can thrive only if we are our best version can we be of best service to others and i think ultimately that is really why we're here Thank you so much for taking your time to listen and contemplate, and I hope you got inspired and enjoyed what you heard.